there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. American adults suffer from anxiety disorders. Few people realise depression and anxiety are the leading cause of disability in Australia. The elderly and even children experience symptoms of anxiety. While the disorders are treatable, only one in every three people who suffer from anxiety ever seek treatment. Everyone has anxiety. At least, that's what they say. And it's true. It's a normal, everyday thing to experience anxiety occasionally. However, when you're experiencing anxiousness that is persistent, overwhelming, and seemingly uncontrollable, it can be absolutely disabling. Hi, I'm Jason, and I suffer from a pretty extreme case of generalized anxiety disorder. My name is Kelsey Matthews, and I work in entertainment here in Hollywood. The best way to explain anxiety is literally like this voice in your head telling you're not good enough all the time, and it makes everything seem like you are messing up and uh, it, it can be a little bit much. And it goes hand in hand with like PTSD and depression and everything like that. Um, I feel like they both co coincide. I'm Rick and I was diagnosed with uh, anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder and a little bit of obsessive compulsive disorder in 2003, but I've suffered from it all my life. My name is Dustin and I suffer from anticipatory anxiety. I think people are stressed out, um, but I think that, I wonder if it has to do with that people are just more aware of their feelings. I don't think so, Sharon. To me, anxiety is my worst enemy. Um, I wake up with it in the morning. I live with it throughout the day. I go to bed with it. I remember having anxiety from when I was very little um, until now I'm you know, in my mid 40s. Anxiety has been a constant companion. To me, anxiety means a challenge. It's something that I face every day that I sort of look at as the enemy that I have to overcome and sort of what keeps pushing me in the direction I need to go in life. I'm 40 years old. I grew up in a small town in Southern Virginia, right along the North Carolina border. I've always been kind of a technical guy. I've always been very interested in video and the things you do to make video look good and pretty much since I was seven or eight I kind of focused my whole life on getting out of my small town and to a place where I can help people make their videos and films look good. I don't have a lot to say myself but I am interested in helping other people who have something to say say it the best they can. Anxiety is an epidemic. When anxiety consistently interferes with your everyday activities, you're most likely suffering from an anxiety disorder. An anxiety disorder is a real, serious medical condition, just as real as any physical ailment. Anxiety disorders are the most prevalent and pervasive mental disorders in the US. For people who have one, worry and fear become constant and overwhelming. But with treatment, many people can manage and get back to a fulfilling life. Researchers are unsure of the exact cause of anxiety, but it's likely a combination of factors that play a role. I think I first noticed anxiety was an issue for me back in elementary school at the end of the summer vacations when the school supply commercials would come back on. I would get anxious. I kind of blamed the Trapper Keeper commercials for showing the klutzy kid having a horrible first day at school. It gave me terrible anxiety for going back, and I think that's when I first really noticed it. My anxiety usually comes out of nowhere, and it's brought back by like flashbacks from my PTSD, and it makes me black out, and I like will break down in tears just out of nowhere from it as well. There are five major types of anxiety disorders. Panic disorder, 
aka panic attacks. This disorder is characterized by unexpected and repeated episodes of intense fear or terror, accompanied by physical symptoms such as chest pain, heart palpitations, shortness of breath, dizziness, or abdominal pain. 2. Generalized Anxiety Disorder It is characterized by chronic anxiety even when there is nothing or little to provoke it. Obsessive Compulsive Disorder Characterized by recurrent unwanted thoughts, obsession, and or repetitive behaviors or compulsions. Repetitive behaviors such as hand washing, counting, checking, or cleaning are often performed with the hope of preventing obsessive thoughts or making them go away. Performing these so-called rituals, however, provides only temporary relief, and not performing them markedly increases anxiety. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. PTSD is an anxiety disorder that can develop after exposure to a terrifying event or ordeal in which grave physical harm occurred or was threatened. The fifth type of anxiety disorder is social phobia, or social anxiety disorder. It's an anxiety disorder characterized by overwhelming anxiety and excessive self-consciousness in everyday social situations. Social phobia can be limited to only one type of situation, such as fear of speaking in a formal or informal event, or eating or drinking in front of others, or in its most severe form may be so broad that a person experiences symptoms almost any time they are around other people. Physically, um, anxiety makes me feel well, tense. <laughs> um, I get numbness in my hands. Um, I, I get a, a heaviness in my chest. Uh, my stomach contracts, uh, uh, becomes upset. Uh, I get headaches sometimes. I have trouble sleeping. I tend to avoid things that make me anxious and I will feign sleep. And eventually, when one feigns sleep, one goes to sleep. So I sleep a lot or I will work on things that have nothing whatsoever to do with the thing that is making me anxious. Even though the thing that's making me anxious probably shouldn't make me anxious, it's just part of my brain chemistry that's amplifying and um, overdriving, like a guitar. A little strum of something that needs to be taken care of and turning it into a kind of a industrial style sawtooth, wail of frustration and rage and fear. It's like having Nine Inch Nails in your head playing all the time. Lots of, uh, you know, your body actually tenses up with anxiety attacks a lot too. So I get muscle aches from it. Um, I don't sleep very well, so I usually have bags underneath my eyes recently because it's been so aggressive as of recent. But for me, it's it just weighs down on your body a lot and gives a complete exhaustion. You just, you feel so fatigued that it's hard to have any want to do anything. If you have an anxiety disorder, you may also be depressed. While anxiety and depression can occur separately, it's not unusual for these mental health disorders to happen together. Anxiety can be a symptom of clinical or major depression. Likewise, Worsening symptoms of depression can be triggered by an anxiety disorder. Anxiety is always there, ready for something to worry about, whether it's how poorly you're doing in life or uh, outlandish things that could never happen. With anticipatory anxiety, it's interesting because it'll be very extreme. I would say it's a 10 when I'm about to do certain things, but then once I'm in the moment for what I was worried about, it completely dissipates and it's pretty much a zero. My anxiety would keep me up at night and leave me too tired to keep my house the way it should be to have people over and to make personal relationships and to uh, find uh, romantic partners. On a scale from 1 to 10, I would say my anxiety is about a, a 9. Um, I don't think I've ever had what would be called a, a panic attack, you know, where it felt like a heart attack or something like that, but I. I, I just live in a constant state of uh, heightened tension. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'd say my anxiety was at about a 7 or an 8. So currently mine's like an 8 to 9, um, and that's because I've had a lot of things that have been triggering me lately with my PTSD, and I seem to like have worse anxiety attacks when that occurs. What's interesting about anticipatory anxiety is that it's 
it's completely it's subjective to different people because it's based on what you worry about could possibly happening um, for me because I live outside of LA and I often have to come to LA for things I have anxiety about what could happen on the drive um, you know having car trouble having my phone the battery die I don't know where I'm at it's a lot of things that I think I realize are very neurotic to worry about but you kind of really can't help it anyways and I think that it takes um, getting within, like if I'm worried about the drive, once I'm actually on the road, it starts to slowly go away because reality sets in that I'm okay and it's not what I thought it was gonna be. I was not able to have the personal life that I wanted because I was deathly afraid of screwing things up even though I didn't need to be. I think I first realized anxiety was an issue for me in college. Um, I had had it through high school. You know, I was somebody that was always worried about what other people would think. I would lay awake at night sometimes just worrying about the day-to-day -day of school, like, you know, way too much. I'm a survivor of domestic violence and uh, still dealing with my ex and court stuff. So whenever that happens, um, I get overwhelmed a bit um, just because it brings like all those past traumas and can be a little bit much and so then my anxiety just takes over. The other night I had an event to go to and I was trying to do my makeup and just putting it on I started breaking down crying because I had like a flashback just out of nowhere. So it's like little things like that and the anxiety just kind of overwhelms you and it doesn't want to make you go anywhere you just want to hide away in your covers. Well I mean thinking back to like my childhood I feel like a lot of it is just it sort of like was little things like I was thinking about this earlier actually my parents are divorced. They divorced when I was a really young age, and I didn't see my dad a lot. And I remember when I was really young, on his weekends to come see us, which was maybe once every couple months, there were sometimes when he didn't show up. And me and my sister would be waiting at the screen door for him to show up for hours on end sometimes, and he wouldn't come. And I think that that's actually sort of like what really instilled in me that I have to worry about things, that things may not go the way that you want. And I think that then once I got more into school, you know, as the years went on and I got older, it started to morph into other forms of anxiety. And my life was going very, very poorly in early 2003. The anxiety was really an anchor holding me down uh, with just me having my nose and mouth above water barely and sometimes popping underneath and then trying to pop back up. It was a very dark and scary time in my life. Um, for me, it gets so bad, like the smallest little things will trigger you. Um, like just driving, like you become really tense. Uh, my dog, if she just pulls a little wrong the wrong way, I get overly anxious about it and it makes me upset. The things that most people would not get upset about now become just like 10 times worse for me. And But then like when there's like the things like my PTSD triggers, then that actually makes everything like just tenfold. So I feel like it's more so like if, it just depends on if I'm being triggered by something um, but I usually, I'm always like high, super tense now and everything kind of like makes me a little bit edgy. It was when I started college that I first noticed the debilitating effects that anxiety could have. You know, all, all of a sudden I was having trouble getting out of bed. I was having trouble concentrating on studies. Um, I was having trouble going to work. Um, I would get really anxious in social situations. It, it seemed the older I got, the, the, the harder it was. We spoke with four young adults who have been battling anxiety and depression. I've found ways to cope. The, the therapy aspect of it is huge. I'm on an antidepressant. I decided that I, I would try my best. Um, I sought out counseling in my early 20s, actually, because I have some other medical issues that were actually induced by my anxiety. So I kind of had to go and get a full thing done with a couple different doctors. I was 22 when I came out here in 2001, and I was 24 when I sought treatment and was, was diagnosed. Six weeks. It, it was night and day, and it seemed so fast. I look at my journal entries, because I kept an online journal like one does when you're 
an arty kid in, you know, your early 20s, in the early 2000s, you know, your live journal, your diary land, whatever. I looked back at my online journal entries and during the depths of anxiety, there would be words and pages and expression. I'm, I'm talking graphic design in these diary entries that just showing just, I was showing myself in what bad shape I was. And within about six weeks, my entries became much more matter of fact and positive and dwelled less on how I was feeling and the negativity of that and just more on what I was doing with occasional flashes of I can't believe I've come this far but most of the time I was just living my life again and not really dwelling on how bad it had been which I think is the goal of any successful treatment causing the body and the mind and the soul to forget how bad things were, especially for anxiety, when the disease itself is always there, promising to remind you of how bad things were before and how bad they could be in the future. Anxiety makes it to where I have trouble performing even the simplest tasks. I will put off going to the grocery store because I don't want to drive. I, I, I'm, I'm honestly scared to death to drive. Like, I won't take uh, unprotected lefts. Like, if I pull out onto a main street and you have to go left, I won't take it. I was an easygoing person, pretty bubbly, pretty happy all the time. Um, I just went with the flow. I never really had, like, set plans for things. I kind of would just go on a whim. And now, like, I have to have a schedule with what's going to happen or I get super high stressed. Um, it's just, it's really changed my life overall and it's caused my body to have body aches and everything like that where I had to get physical therapy for it and um, it's caused other health issues and it's, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I always knew I wasn't normal, but that word is so loaded with connotations, especially in the uh, mid to late 90s. No one wanted to be normal, I just figured I was sensitive and had other things on my mind. It was never something that held me back or presented a major problem until my senior year of college. I lived by myself in a dorm. I had the entire room to myself. I had it decorated the way I liked. I didn't have to share a schedule with anyone or share any living space with anyone. It was just kind of me and I could do what I wanted, uh, research what I wanted. I was able to run the student television station from that room and it was nice because I didn't have to kind of show myself or face problems. I could kind of deal with them from a distance. And that's when I started realizing I was spending a lot of time on the couch immobile, just waiting for the ability to get up and do the thing that needed doing, whether it was washing clothes, vacuuming the carpet, writing the paper, editing the documentary, anything. And that's when I first realized this isn't right. There is something wrong with me. The anxiety got really bad for me in high school. I was bullied a lot. You know, I, I came out as gay in junior high, so high school wasn't particularly awesome for me. So I had a lot of anxiety then that then sort of um, morphed into physical problems. Like with my stomach, um, I ended up getting irritable bowel syndrome and that was because of the anxiety. And so it's frustrating because I often now have anxiety over having IBS symptoms, which were brought on from the anxiety. So it's one of those catch-22 things that it's really difficult to manage, but you have to stay rational about. Sometimes just getting out of bed. Um, yeah, getting out of bed. Um, sometimes just brushing your hair or, you know, just the smallest little things like taking my dog out, like, oh, I, I get anxious about that, like, you know, running into somebody, having a conversation, whatever I'm dealing with these things in my head. Even going to sleep at night, I don't sleep very well because my brain is running 24-7 telling me what I need to get done or what I did wrong today. I don't know, like, those little things, like, you take for granted because back in the day it was like no big deal and now I feel like I'm just constantly on edge. When I was lying on the couch 
sweating, shaking, avoiding, and just trapped in a loop of thought. Uh, my thoughts would also always come back to this face, this giant face of a, a housefly with its compound eyes and its antennae and its uh, mandibles. And it would be thinking to me, you are me, I am you, this is what it will always be buzzing around, not accomplishing anything. Anxiety affects every area of my life. Um, I've lost jobs over it, I've lost friends. You know, for example, you know, I'll have a, I'll have a, a freelance editing job and like I just won't be able to bring myself to work on it. Like I'll, I'll get up and I'll just get anxious about what I'm gonna do, you know, how I'm gonna approach it, how I'm gonna approach the workflow and I'll just find excuses to not work. You know, I'll, uh, you know, busy work or I'll, you know, reorganize the files or stuff like that. Um, with relationships, I, I really like people and I, I wanna reach out to people, but you know, I get scared of how they're going to react or how they think about me or how I feel they think about me. I'll say, I'll make plans to go somewhere and then it'll come time to do it and I'll start getting anxious about going to that place. Where am I gonna park? Um, you know, uh, how much is it gonna cost? Is it, there gonna be too many people there? You know, I'm not gonna like it anyway. I might as well just stay home. And then nine times out of 10, I just end up staying home. And, you know, eventually people will get tired of trying. You know, they won't wanna hang out with you anymore and, you know, you'll lose friends. And I've lost many like that over the years. So at Home Life, um my poor pup, she's a service puppy, so she's very in tune with me, but I feel bad sometimes because I get really high stress with her whenever she just acts out a little bit. And it's not really her acting out, it's her playing off my emotions. So for me, like that makes me feel like kind of like a bad dog mom, you know? <laughs> so there is that, and then dealing with my mother and my brother, um, who live far away, but they're not, easy to deal with in general and it makes it even harder to deal with them and can cause me to just break down in tears when I have to like cut myself off from them at, at times. The anxiety at home. So let's say that um, I have made a very big uh, dinner of food I like but that's a little messy to make uh, and um, I don't have time to clean it up. I'm too tired to clean it up for whatever reason. I leave it in the sink. Um, the next day I wake up late because I've been staying up late, even though I was really tired. I didn't have the energy to wash dishes, but I had the energy to lay in bed and sweat and worry how I'm going to make uh, the deadline for the project I'm working on at work and worry about what happens if my car tires blow out on the freeway, things like that. The anxiety was comorbid with kind of an obsessive compulsive disorder. And I'm told this is often the case. Anxiety is comorbid with other serotonin related diseases as you know, uh, it's thought of currently. So with depression, you'll find anxiety. With obsessive compulsive disorder, you'll find anxiety. Um, anxiety just kind of, I don't know whether it's an effect of the major disease or the thing that kind of causes the major disease. Work is one place where you have to be able to concentrate, take in information, and decide the best course of action with a clear mind. Anxiety at work can be a big obstacle for all these things. 72% of people who have daily stress and anxiety say it interferes with their work dramatically. Some of the main culprits of workplace anxiety are deadlines, interpersonal relationships, staff management, and troubleshooting. To reduce the role of worry in our working lives, we need to become more tolerant of uncertainty. We cannot avoid it and the time we use trying to counter it can be very counterproductive. And then work life, it, it gets really overwhelming. Like, if I mess up on something, I punish myself now. Like, I punish myself so hard. 
I could be working on a project and I just make one little mistake and everyone's like, oh no, it's fine. For me, I will keep apologizing the rest of the day for it because it's on my mind. It was definitely interfering with my job. My superiors had noticed and had said, I don't know what's going on, Rick, but you need to do something about it and soon. It affects my work the most <clears throat> because what I do takes a lot of guts. I have to present myself to a lot of people. Um, I'm judged by a lot of people. Um, I have to be able to manage um, important situations um, under really stressful conditions. So I would say that if I was to give in to the anxiety, it would be completely crippling. I, there's times too when I do have to give into it because it's so overwhelming and I end up missing out on certain things in life. But when it comes to my work, because my career is so important to me, I, I kind of make that the challenge I have to overcome every time. So while it's really, really difficult for me sometimes to do certain things in my career, it ends up being that much more rewarding when I can get through it. My anxiety at work would have me planning for things that I didn't need to plan for and not focusing on the job at hand and focusing on things kind of down the road and not in a very productive sense, but again, in the sense that it's something I don't really need to worry about. And that would impact my present work that I should be focusing on. So my work performance was not the best for the first two years of uh, my career. And it all kind of snowballs, you know, if your work performance isn't the best, you don't get a raise, you don't get a raise, but rent goes up, uh, then you have to worry about how you're gonna make that extra money, you don't get to go out with friends uh, as much, and you don't get to network and meet people. So it is kind of a vicious cycle, to use that old cliche. In American capitalism, you don't really have to have a reason or a real reason to lose a job. Uh, I have been laid off before um, and I am positive that my anxiety contributed to that somehow. Um, I definitely have lost relationships because I have been worried about them and my anxiety will prod me to either avoid the source of my worry, my friendship, or latch on like a cheap suit and be all over them and kind of chase them away. Uh, it goes both ways, but um, I've definitely lost uh, relationships over anxiety. I was actually supposed to work with a pretty big band. They were gonna have me working their merch table and it was gonna require me to travel out of state. And at the time I was living back in the Midwest and I actually used to have some travel phobia and that was part of the anxiety. And I ended up last minute backing out of the gig and it really upset him and I you know, told him that it was because I was sick but obviously it's because of the anxiety. But the thing about anxiety, I think as an adult, is it's a lot of adults feel embarrassed to talk about it. Like you feel kind of, I don't know, like a dork being like, oh, my anxiety. So you end up usually making up another excuse. And I think that that's what's really important about this documentary is that people need to understand that that's really how it works. So I have noticed in some of my interns and entry-level coworkers the same signs of having an untreated anxiety-related disorder. And in general, when uh, an adult leaves college and goes out into the workforce, that is when things start going into overdrive for that kind of disease. They're away from home, perhaps for the first time, they're away from their usual support structures or in an unusual environment, uh, a high pressure, fast paced environment where they have a lot of worry about whether they'll excel and whether they'll make it out here, whether they'll make it in Hollywood. I think that you get extra perceptive, you know, to it and other people because they have sort of the same man mannerisms that they have about themselves, the way they carry themselves and maybe the way they're wording something or being a little bit more mousy. And I tend to gravitate towards people like that in life, actually, I feel like because I can relate to them and I want them to feel comfortable in the situations they're in. So like I have like an effects girl I know that suffers a lot from anxiety and I make a point to always involve her because I know that it's difficult typically for her to get work because of it. And I want her to know that there's a place for her in the world. And I think that it's important for all of us to sort of help each other with that. And that's a good way to really get over it. Just being able to see someone being habitually late uh, or being a little scattered in their thought processes and tasks, even though they have a list of tasks they're given at the beginning of each day. 
sometimes uh, interns will have kind of outlandish, risky behavior that I'll hear about or that they'll display. Sometimes interns will be very reserved and quiet and uh, introverted. I can look back at the times I was introverted and if I see something that they've done that I used to do, like taking lunch by myself or taking a long time in the restroom to kind of recharge. Or if I see the risky behavior like um, uh, abuse of uh, other prescription drugs or um, just you know, drinking to excess or things like that, um, I can point to that and say, hey, can I talk to you for a second? You know, there's no, uh, ju no judgment here. I've just been through this before. And uh, can I ask you if you've ever felt like this? If things, if you think, if you worry about things a lot that you don't need to worry about. It overwhelms, everything overwhelms you. It's like the smallest task become the biggest task ever. Being around friends whenever you're at that full moment of anxiety, it can be a much on them. And my friends though, like I said, they they understand what I'm going through. They've been very, very gracious and kind and just patient with me. And I think it's good when you have anxiety to have a good support unit. And I've lost friends over the years from all this, but the people that have been right by my side, they get it and they love me for me, so they are willing to work with me through those moments. If you find yourself held back for no good reason, but that doesn't matter, you're still held back, you're still holding yourself back somehow, your body isn't letting you do something, or your brain is not letting you complete a task that your body has already started. And usually when I say, I felt like that my whole life until I got treatment, that is when, if they say, really? Or if they say, you felt like that? When they say something that indicates to me that they felt the same way their whole lives, that's when I know I can talk very frankly and share some of my experience and some of my former interns' experiences as well, if they're comfortable with me sharing that. Having said that, I generally do not discuss it with coworkers above my level unless we are friends outside of work. There's not as much stigma with having an anxiety disorder or uh, a little depression or a little OCD. Some uh, firms actually look for people with those traits that those diseases can bring out. Uh, because it may mean that they're detail oriented and if they can if they've been in the business long enough it generally means they can handle and manage and control it and use some of those uh, traits and behaviors to their advantage and then to the firm's advantage. I do consider anxiety to be an illness. Anxiety is a defense mechanism however when it reaches a certain level of intensity and frequency, it stops being useful. Rather than fueling foresight, it becomes a source of suffering and distraction. This kind of relentless anxiety makes it hard to fully enjoy life. It is often a symptom of an anxiety disorder, which is an illness. My dreams were uh, very anxious. I missed an entire semester of class and I have to take the exam and, oh no, where are my clothes? Uh, lots of falling dreams, lots of drowning dreams, lots of, why am I driving this car not on the road? It is falling towards a swamp. Things like that. Very, very strange things. Often very uh, shocking and violent dreams. I'd had many dreams where I would wake up and say, huh, I feel funny, and see uh, the aftermath of uh, some violent struggle or carnage or gore on the wall and one one particularly bad dream during the worst part of my anxiety before I sought treatment I woke up and felt very strange and I raised my right hand and there was a smoking gun in it and I looked in my closet mirror door and my brains were on the far wall and there was a hole in my head but I was still moving and thinking and doing and my thought as i woke up was oh no even this didn't get rid of it that was 
really, I think, the thing that caused me to seek treatment. Not the job, not being lonely, not the money or anything economic. Just the idea that if I don't get this under control, uh, I might hurt myself. I actually had a long discussion with one of my very close friends the other day about it. I feel like I'm constantly like a burden or <laughs> letting people down all the time because of it. And I know that that's the anxiety of it and all. And um, it's like, I, it's hard to be around me is what I feel like, but my friends, they understand. And um, I'm one of those people now, my anxiety controls my decisions. Usually I, when I have to go to something, I'm like, yeah, I'll be there, you know, no big deal. Now, if my anxiety gets the best of me, I have to cancel because I know if it's gonna overwhelm me getting ready, it's gonna overwhelm me getting there, it's gonna overwhelm me just being around people, and you never know how it's gonna like, you know, and I don't wanna ever lash out anyone. And one of my very best friends the other day, like, he asked me to do something when I was already dealing with anxiety and trying to get ready for something else. And it was like the smallest uh, like thing. And I snapped I, and I apologize and I continually apologize. He's like, stop apologizing. It's been two days now and I'm still apologizing. Throughout history, I mean, as a human society, we haven't handled um, mental issues very well. A common misconception about anxiety is that most people believe anxiety is a sign of personal weakness it's seen as a mental sort of malady. Oh, she has anxiety and depression. And it's like, no, I have anxiety and depression the same way a person has hypoglycemia or diabetes or anything else. For people actually experiencing anxiety, the perception that most people will have a negative attitude towards their condition reduces the chances that they'll even seek support, both formally and informally. People expect children and teenagers to have anxiety because they have so many things to be anxious about growing up, but I think that society expects you to sort of grow out of it. I think that for most people that work a nine to five job and are married and have kids and all of that, they have such a routine life that they often don't face the types of anxiety maybe someone like I, I do face. And so it can be hard for me to talk about it to other people because they may not be able to relate. They're like, well, it's not stressful for me to go to work. Why is it stressful for you? And so I think that it's different you know, for different people for sure. Honestly, it's like, it's usually like, oh, that makes more sense now. <laughs> um, because before people would be like, oh, why is this person crazy? Like, what's wrong with them? Um, but now, like, whenever you tell them, yeah, this is why I'm this way. And then they're like, OK, this makes more sense. And I'm so sorry you're going through this. But how can I help? And so it opens a door of communication and understanding. But yeah, no, usually it's a better response than I think it's going to be. In your head, it feels like no one's going to want to be around you. Like you're just going to be like this black sheep in the group or something. And it's never that case. It's usually how can I help? How can I be there for you? And it's been very rewarding in that fact. A paper published recently online in the journal Brain and Behavior suggests that women are almost twice as likely as men to experience anxiety. That said, there's a growing recognition among psychologists that men are more likely to suffer in silence. Instead of saying they're anxious, they complain of headaches and muscle aches and pains. They are more likely to use alcohol and drugs to cope with anxiety. So what looks like a drinking problem may actually be an anxiety disorder. Also, anxiety in men often manifests as anger and irritability. The social stigma surrounding anxiety can make it harder for a man to come forward with their issues. And that's what's interesting is I think a lot of men actually suffer from anxiety because they're expected to not have anxiety. And so it's really difficult for people to talk about it as a whole. Anxiety, it's like it's gender neutral. It's literally attacks everyone and some get it from different things, but it will come in the same light, I feel like, and it attacks the same way and it plagues you uh, in a way, in your mind. So I feel like it, it has, it takes all surrender. Like it, it just takes all victims and all kinds. One of my friends, one of my good friends, he actually has some severe anxiety as well. And the little task that he's put forth, and we work together a lot, and the little tasks that he'll get um, overwhelm him sometimes. 
Overcoming stigma for anxiety is one of the biggest barriers to people seeking help. It's what mental health professionals call social stigma. Essentially, social stigma is the negative view that others can project onto people who reveal particular imperfections or problems. One of the largest factors that makes stigma so powerful is it can lead people to reject or exclude others. It is common for someone with anxiety or other psychological problems to think that if they reveal their struggles, they will suffer serious social or professional problems. Since being thought of as crazy or insane carries a significant stigma in the American culture. Think about how often it is that we use those words to insult someone. Any possibility that one could be misunderstood and seen as crazy is significantly threatening. I do openly discuss my anxiety now, but for years I just lived with it. You know, I, as a, you know, a man in today's society, I just, you know, I, I think I was always taught that, you know, to show, you know, anxiety or depression was a sign of weakness. So I would just, you know, suffer silently, put on a good face, uh, pretend everything was okay, and move forward. And over the years, as I get older and older, it feels like the anxiety compounds, you know, and things that were once very doable for me, you know, now become harder and harder. Like, you know, I find one of the hardest things to do now is, you know, to go get in my car and drive to an unfamiliar, you know, grocery store or movie theater or, you know, a restaurant. You know, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I'll spend all kinds of money on, you know, DoorDash or, you know, Ubering places just because I'm too anxious to drive, you know, which, you know, begs the question, you know, why am I paying a car payment? So... I will openly discuss anxiety with friends and coworkers at or below my level, especially entry level employees or interns who I think could benefit from some of my experience. Uh, I'm pretty good at telling when someone has anxiety because I've been through it and I know the signs and I've heard some of the same thoughts in my head coming out of some of my interns mouths. And immediately I say to them, hey, let's talk about this, all right? The work can wait for a second. We need to focus on you because you can't do the work if you're not working at your best potential. I'm gonna tell you my story and I want you to tell me if this seems familiar because it is something that can be treated successfully and that you can manage and work through and in some cases overcome. There's such a stigma. I think that people look at it almost as like someone who has anxiety has problems or they're difficult or they're gonna be complaining a lot. And so I don't, because I'm in a position where I have to really put myself out there for people and to, I have to appear to have such confidence that I just don't let the anxiety show. You know, I'll do whatever I can to not show it. A key element in reducing stigma related to mental health is for everyone within the community to have a good understanding of anxiety. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in this country. We can all relate to that tense, distressed feeling, but what causes so many people to live with fear? I have not really done therapy on the regular. Um, I have had a couple of consultations. Um, I think that that's something though that I should probably do. I would seek therapy if I could find the time and the money for it. Many people with anxiety never seek help. Despite the importance of mental health care, many people are afraid of being stigmatized if they admit they need help. Not being able to pay for treatment is another big issue. Although most insurers cover mental health to some degree, not everyone can afford insurance. What's more, young adults who are less likely to have insurance are also at higher risk for addiction and other mental health issues. And some lower income populations face unique pressures that can increase the chances of mental illness. Then there's fear of treatment itself. Someone who has not been treated for a mental health issue might have some pretty strange ideas about how it's done. Some people may simply fear the vulnerability of telling a stranger their problems. In reality, therapy is nothing to be scared of. The setting is quite relaxed and you don't have to discuss anything you're not comfortable with. Treatment often involves some kind of medication too, 
which may require some trial and error to get right. However, most people benefit from treatment to some degree, and many notice significant improvements in a relatively short amount of time. At the moment, I don't have health insurance, so I can't get uh, some of the treatment I want or need. I can get the drugs from online pharmacies. That's not a problem. Having people to talk to and having the time and energy and disinterest or perhaps distance to be able to look back at my thoughts and actions uh, and look at what could be causing them and work on those causes. That's something uh, I am doing more. If you're anxious frequently, you may decide you'd like a drink to calm your nerves. After all, alcohol is a sedative. In a social setting, that may feel just like the answer you need to let your guard down. Ultimately, it may not be the best solution. Some people with anxiety disorders end up abusing alcohol and or other drugs in an effort to feel better regularly. This can create dependency and addiction. So over the years, I've coped with anxiety in different ways. Uh, when I was a little younger, I probably self-medicated with alcohol quite a bit. I, I don't think it got to the point where I would consider myself an alcoholic, but I was drinking nightly, you know, two or three drinks, sometimes more, you know, just to feel okay, to be able to go to sleep. And then I discovered uh, CBD and THC. Um, I never liked smoking it, but once it was legalized in California and they started doing the edibles and the sprays and the tinctures, um, I got into that a little bit more and medicated with that. But more productively recently, I've started into meditation. Um, I've been doing guided meditation for about a year. I do it in the morning when I wake up and at night right before I go to bed. And then, you know, depending on how severe my anxiety is during the day, I might do a quick session in the middle of the day. Um, I do breathing exercises, um, progressive muscle relaxation, passive uh, muscle relaxation, and uh, I find those things help. So regarding the treatment, my psychiatrist said, here, take these pills. Also, I want you to start therapy. I did not start therapy. I did not do therapy once. And what I did find was that uh, once I was being treated successfully and effectively with the SSRIs, I was able to look at past behaviors and kind of maybe not give myself therapy, but look at the motivations and the patterns of thinking that were in evidence and find ways, very effective ways to get around those. So at least I have that going for myself, which is nice. Yeah, I openly smoke marijuana now. I actually, and I've never publicly said this, but I smoke an average of about eight times a day. Um, anybody that's known me in the last 20 years hasn't seen me not under the influence, actually, because it's what got me through college. It's what got me through all of the situations I'm going through now because, and there's a popular medical discussions about it, but for me, when I smoke marijuana after I eat, it's my digestive that I have problems with. So if I smoke after I eat, it calms my digestion, which calms my anxiety. And so if I... Because of the IBS symptoms, I can't eat full meals also. So I have to have something smaller every two hours. So essentially I have to smoke pot every two hours after I eat, but that's sort of what keeps me on the same calm level. You know, I like to go on hikes to combat it. Although uh, recently, you know, just deciding to go to the park to hike, you know, like, you know, driving out there or walking out there, sometimes I'll get nervous. So a new thing I've been training is transcendental meditation. It's been helping quite a bit. Um, then there's other times where I just sit in silence, sitting in silence, focusing on my breathing, on my heart rate, if you, um, which is part of the meditation part too. But just sometimes doing that and just recentering. I do often meditate. I've tried meditation. I've actually been to four different doctors for the IBS symptoms. I've done everything from pills to meditation to, to marijuana and drinking. And I found that Meditation works really well for me, but because of my profession, I often don't make enough time for myself to really get in the zone. You really have to be fully committed for med meditation to work. So for me, sometimes it's easier to just load a bowl, smoke, and then go back to work. My biggest thing now is if I write it out, um, I start like a blog to like journal my, my um, journey. When I write it down, it seems to relax me more because I'm releasing whatever is plaguing my mind at that moment. 
Yeah, I do exercise, and that does actually help. I notice that physical activity helps a lot because it gets your mind off of what you're thinking about. So walking and um, hiking has really helped me a lot. But sometimes you just gotta let the tears come. Sometimes you just gotta like just sit it out and let it come out. My dog, she's the biggest, biggest support for me. She knows what to do. And if I didn't have her, then I don't know what I would do. But um, I think that right there, I think for people who have anxiety, having an animal is key because they, they do help. A lot of it is just constantly reassuring myself because it's like you're self-aware of it. Like you realize that the, I, the thoughts that you're thinking don't make any sense and that it, to you it's so dumb to be worrying about it because you know it's not that it's going to pan out that way. And I think just doing so much that causes anxiety and pushing myself through it, sort of like getting on a roller coaster, like when you're afraid to get on the roller coaster. Once you've got off it, it's exhilarating and you're so glad you did it and now you're not as afraid to do it anymore. So I think that with time, although I still have anxiety, it's sort of like more and more manageable because I can be rational about it the more I do something and realize, look, you've done this 10,000 times. This is exactly what happened. Why are you worried? Stop worrying about it. I didn't really try meditation because when I was in the deepest throes of my anxiety, staying still, trying to clear my head, which is what meditation it, at least partially involves, it would generally be an opening for the anxiety to say, hey, here's something to worry about. Here's something else you haven't thought of. So I didn't make space in my life for meditation. There are thousands of self-help books on the subject. While it's not recommended to self-treat serious issues, they can be a good jumping off point to a better understanding of anxiety and the possible steps you may need to combat it. I've never really read any literature about therapy or meditation, and I've never really gone in for self-help stuff. I've always been kind of an autodidact, and I learn best by trial, error, and experience. So the idea of a self-help book has never appealed to me. A lot of that thought is kind of my upbringing and in general being wary of institutions like churches or um, support groups. And that's probably something I should uh, look at and interrogate to see what my antipathy is and if there's something th about that that is holding me back from my potential. Social media is undoubtedly an outlet that engages most online users. However, according to mental health consultants nationally, social media has become a major anxiety provoking factor. I think that we live in a world that social media has um, sort of catered to fast attention spans and people that want things quickly and often don't take times to fully stop and understand something. And I think that anxiety, because of the world we live in, is a very common thing. And I think that we would get to a better place um, as humans and coexisting together and understanding each other, especially on social media, if we actually did stop for a minute and understand each other's problems, whether it's anxiety, whether it's bullying, anything that can sort of affect the soul and the mind, I think is important, especially in today's day and age, for everyone to stop and pay attention to each other a little bit more. I think that there's a way that you can go about presenting um, yourself to, to an audience. I think that there's a right way to do it, like a, a right time and a right place. I think that. The reason anxiety has sort of the stigma it does is because chronically people that suffer are often posting about it and talking about it. And it sort of creates a sort of idea of what people think that it is. So it's difficult when other people want to go and talk about it. So I think that what's best for understanding is to maybe have someone within a position of power or someone that's respected that can say, look, I have anxiety too, but look at what I was able to do with myself. So I think that in that sort of situation, it's a really positive thing to talk about. But because of, unfortunately, the way that people are judged on social media, the way that people look at your Facebook page and, and think of you in that way, that if it's something that you're chronically suffering with, you're probably not going to find the answers on social media. Now we get to the most important message. How can we reduce stigma related to social anxiety disorder? It's not going to be an easy fix, unfortunately, and will require changes in attitudes through education. I have been very open with using my platform to spread awareness for things such as anxiety, PTSD, domestic violence. I, I've decided I wanted to not put a facade on anymore. Um, for so long you put on a face to appear like you're happy all the time so uh, people don't ask questions. But now I 
feel like that with social media and everything, everyone's living in this fake life and it causes other people to have depression issues um, because they're not living up to the same standard as someone else. I do enjoy helping people see that they don't have to live the way I did or the way they're living, that there's something they can do about it, maybe temporarily, maybe not, but any kind of respite or relief that I can give someone, I'm pleased to do it and I'm glad I can do it. For me, being open about it has been the most healing part about it because I'm no longer holding a secret. It's more so of I'm letting people in and saying I'm not okay, but that is okay. And it's allowing others to reach out to me too. And it's created like a support network of people. It also explains why I act certain ways too. Like, you know, sometimes you don't want to talk about it like when you're going through it, but if people already know that you're dealing with these things, then they can accept it. If I could go back and talk to myself when I was at the worst part of my anxiety, I would tell myself the same thing I tell my interns and uh, entry-level co-workers who I mentor, that this is something you can get through. Uh, it helps if you have the support of your family and your friends. You don't have to tell everybody, but you do need to tell the people you trust. You don't need to let it get any worse before you get treatment. Get treated as soon as you can and explore alternative support structures in case the medicines don't work as well as they should or if they stop working after a period of time. It's still, there's still a lot of work to be done. I don't enjoy feeling negative emotions, but I welcome them because I know they're a part of life and they're a part of who I am. So it's been 16 years since my diagnosis. I'm nowhere near as bad as I was 16 years ago, but I do have a lot of anxiety and I do. Before I would pride myself on being uh, calm, cool, and collected when emergencies emerged and now I kind of go to pieces. My wife has remarked on it and um, my coworkers have not remarked on it to my face, but I kind of wish they would. Even without the help of drugs, I know it can be done and I'm gonna give it a shot as opposed to just lying on the couch and not giving it a shot and saying, get up, get up, do it, and feeling bad about not doing it. That executive dysfunction is uh, something that I am keeping at bay for the most part. I need to just calm down. You can't focus so much of your time worrying about uncertainty because it can really destroy you. And I think that early on in my career, it did guide me into some bad places because I let it control me. And I think that maybe I would have gone back now and, and told me to really look at the big picture and see where I'm going. Once I went to a psychiatrist and he diagnosed me and began treatment, once the treatment started working, things got much, much better. Um, and my career kind of took off like a rocket, and I got a girlfriend, got engaged, got married, all that good stuff. Worldwide, let's work toward breaking the silence about mental health for social anxiety disorder and all mental illnesses. Let's follow in the footsteps of such countries as Australia and the UK that are working towards integrating mental health care and therapy as a routine part of care. By being more open, I'm just allowing myself to be more real and help others through my journey. If there's one thing in general I wanted people with anxiety to know, it's that there's nothing wrong with them. Any person who didn't have an anxiety disorder and was faced with the things that people with anxiety worry about would worry the same way. They may not react the same way, they may not do the same things because it's new to them and their coping methods are different. They grew up with different coping methods. And people with anxiety can learn those coping methods and they can get treatment, whether it's medication, whether it's meditation. There are things that they can do to reduce the effect anxiety has on their lives. One of the biggest things I've learned through my journey with healing and everything that I went through in the last couple years is being open. Um, someone might need your smile more than you need your tears. I'm working my way to becoming a less anxious person and I think you can do it too.